So when we think about what makes a data culture, we've outlined a couple of different elements. And I think the first one is this idea of user-centered, which is really about access. So do the people who need the data to be able to make these decisions have access to it? And I will just share like a personal anecdote. When I worked at a state agency, in order to get data, I had to send a formal request um, that had to get approved by my department chair and then go to the data team. And then there was a seven to 10 day turnaround before I got the report. And so I really had to think about data as like a summative assessment, right? Like it was, there was no given that process. And there was a lot of really good reasons for that process at the time around like student data privacy and all those things that are really important too. I don't want to minimize that, but there was no world in which I could use this in a rapid iterative way, right? Just, just given the process that was spelled out for me. So thinking about how can we shift that process to make it so that teachers, principals, district leaders, different folks all across the system have access to the data so that they can use it. The second is promoting equity and inclusion. And so this has two pieces. One is internally. Internally, are we collecting information that represents different stakeholders to help understand the extent to which different um, subgroups are experiencing education and, and our culture? and different sides of the work. And then externally, we know that knowledge is power. And in order to be able to uh, exercise that power, you need to have access to the information. One thing to know about this framework, this is something again that Lauren and I have been using just to kind of guide our thinking. If the question is, how do we really nurture um, strong data culture in schools. What, it, what does that mean? How do we define a strong data culture? And so, yeah, she was talking about accessibility and the fact that it's designed to be user-centered. It's sustainable. It's embedded in our practice every day. There is alignment there between the information that we're choosing to collect and what we know is most important around how to help our students succeed. Kind of going on the opposite then there, that promoting equity and inclusion, we want it to be information that in Internally, we take a real conscious look at how representative the data are, what our biases are around that information, that we're naming that and we're, we're neutralizing it. And externally, we're distributing that power associated with having information, especially around disenfranchised populations, making sure that everyone has an opportunity to access, access that informa information, know the information, use the information, transparency, dialogue, shared decision-making, all really critical when it comes to equity and inclusion in the data culture. The responsiveness is another, I think, really critical piece of, of what a data, a strong data culture looks like. It means that we can quickly respond um, when things change. And we felt that really intimately uh, in 2020, that we've got systems and policies and practices that when we have to pivot really quickly, our system can pivot with us. We can ask different questions and we can collect different data without having to jump through a lot of hoops or you know, completely shift funding streams. We want to create a culture where our data collection and our data usage can be really flexible and responsive. But this last one here at the bottom, which is actually where we're really digging in today, is this idea that we want our data systems to represent a holistic view of our system. We want to make decisions about the data that we collect the extent to which we use it that are representative of the whole child. That link there gets to the, the ASCD definition of that and provide us with a comprehensive view of all of the factors that shape a student's educational experience. So the holistic nature of that is, is really critical and that's kind of what we're digging into today. So because of that, I think there are two critical decisions here that we wanted to draw your attention to because it'll kind of guide where we go from here. The first one is, we've kind of mentioned this, but just to call it out specifically, the kind of data that you choose to collect and the extent to which you collect it. Data collection is a very active thing. You have to decide this information matters. I'm going to invest resources into collecting it and storing it in a way that can be used. And it's worth noting that sometimes you have the good fortune that you didn't actually decide to collect information, but you have it anyway. I'll actually share an example of that here in a second. But typically you've got to decide actively that I'm going to collect this information because it matters. I'm going to invest resources around that. And that's what leads to actually having the information that you can use. And then the second one there is the extent to which you decide to use the information, which really impacts the sharing of the data. You can have information all day long. You can choose to collect it. You may not choose to use it. The best example I can give of this, which uh, I've done a lot of survey surveying in my career. And one of my biggest pet peeves is check the box surveys where someone will recognize, oh, it's important if I ask for opinions on this or ask people about their experience or 
um, collect perception data in some way without ever really having or intending to use it in any meaningful way, which I always say the only thing worse than administering a bad survey is administering a survey and not using the data um, because it can be so damaging to the, the trust you have with the, the folks that have taken the time to provide you with that feedback. So that that decision is just as important. You may decide to collect it, but there's a, there's a key decision there around how you're going to use it and how you're gonna share it. So I wanted to give you some examples here. And as I go through these, these examples, think about maybe some examples in your own district that fall in this, this two by two here. Um, so you're looking at the horizontal axis here is that first decision around what you decide to collect. So on one end, you have no information about this. On the other, you have a ton of information and everything in between. And then on the vertical, it's that second decision. You don't use the information at all, or you use it all of the time and then all of the ones in between. So we've got examples in each of these quadrants here. The first one, and I put in parentheses, traditional attendance data. So I would say like, as we talked about data or attendance a year ago, maybe is a great example of information we have a lot of. There's a lot of investment in collecting attendance data, and we certainly use it a lot. We put it in report cards. There are policies around reporting the data. They sometimes funding is attached to attendance data. This is the kind of information that we, we do and have to collect and that we're using and sharing and a lot of ways. Kind of going in clockwise here, an example of information that we have a lot of, maybe, but don't necessarily use, your teachers that are doing distance learning are using all of these platforms that inherently collect a lot of engagement data about your students. When they are clicking on specific content, the amount of time that they are they are using the platform, the number of times that they go back to content before they answer questions. So many of these platforms have embedded data collection that we don't even know is there. I think in most places, we haven't yet decided how we're going to use that information. So just one example of something you may have a lot of but haven't yet decided or started using. Somewhat of a controversial example here possibly, but um, one example of information that I would say that definitely prior to COVID that we did not have much of and didn't really um, use much uh, would be information about students' access to at-home computers and internet. Making a pretty big assumption here, and I'm sure that there are places that have done and were doing better at this even prior to COVID, but the best examples I saw of this were like student questionnaires or parent questionnaires where where we'd ask, do you have a computer at home? Do you have access to internet at home? Typically those response rates were pretty low. So the, the data wasn't very representative across the district, but even in places where they had a lot of it, I just didn't really see them using a lot. Great evidence of this was um, come March, April this year in most, many, probably most school districts, the very first thing we had to do was figure this out. If our kids were gonna be at home and we were gonna be dependent upon distance learning, we had to know who had access and who didn't. And then I actually didn't have an example of information that we don't have, but might be would use frequently if we had it, or might be asking a lot of questions about. But I got this one from a district leader here in Texas, actually last week, where they mentioned that they're using hotspots for internet for kids at home. And they found that some of the hotspots are draining, like their data are draining very quickly. And they suspect that they've, that they've got some platforms that their kids are using that are draining data quicker than others. And so probably even for kids, not not using hotspots, it's draining at home data. So they're asking these questions about data usage of the platforms they're using, but they just don't have any of that information yet. So obviously this is a great example of, of how, you know, their decisions about data in terms of what they collect and what they use will need to change if they wanna to try to solve for that challenge. I gave you all these examples here because I think one key question to ask and to reflect on is examples of information that you need now that you don't have much of.